Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the 2012 Small Business Conference Government Chair Jackie Vitillo and Industry Chair Kurt Anderson. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And welcome. What a, great, what a great house we have here for so early on a Monday morning. Um, as you know me, I'm Kurt Anderson, uh, for those who do know me and those who don't. My pretty picture's up there. Uh, of the 6th Annual 2012 Small Business Conference, Jackie and I appreciate everyone being here on, a, on this very early Monday morning because it's, we know how difficult it is, and I heard there were some traffic issues. So thank you for coming for this incredible event. The first order of business that we have today is the singing of our national anthem. Would everybody please rise? It is now my pleasure to introduce the 2012 Small Business Conference Government Chair, Jackie Patillo. Jackie? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. The American Council for Technology Industry Advisory Council is a unique public-private partnership. It is comprised of industry and government volunteers dedicated to ensuring that together we achieve the mission objectives of this organization. That mission is to help advance the government IT profession, to bring government and industry executives together, to build trust, to improve collaboration, and to enhance the government's ability to serve the nation. There are many exciting things going on in ACT I Act. In an effort to continue the dialogue upon the conclusion of today's event, the association has developed the Knowledge Management Forum. This innovative database provides a way for you to virtually attend every session of this conference. The Knowledge Management Forum is intended to capture knowledge and information from each session, share information across ACT I Act, and to continue today's conversation. The content and outcomes of these proceedings will be posted on the website under the Knowledge Bank tab. We encourage you to visit the website and click on the Knowledge Bank to see all the great things that are happening with ACT I Act and this incredible collaboration. Over to you, Kurt. Thanks, Jackie. I have to say you make a great point in regards to the Knowledge Bank. <clears throat> the Knowledge Bank is a great resource for for information for all the events, programs, sessions conducted by ACT IAC. And as you indicated, Jackie, I hope the individuals in this room have a chance to investigate all its offerings after this event. ACT IAC is the largest federal IT organization, and small businesses account for over 70% of its membership. Yay. 
This year, this year in spirit of our mission, I am pleased to welcome all of you to the sixth annual Small Business Conference with the theme of Connect SB, or Connecting Small Business to Accelerate and Achieve. I am happy to announce this is the largest ever attended act -IAC Small Business Conference with over 400 attendees. Yeah. And it is a testament to the value that government and industry place in being able to participate collaboratively in these sessions and the networking of this event. Please note, and this is critical, this is a vendor neutral event and all discussions are on the record. So please be, be aware of that. In addition, the main plenary sessions, one of which we're in right now, are being recorded so that our Rocky Mountain and Pacific chapters can view these lively discussions at a later date. I also wanted to thank all the media that are present for coming to our event this year. The purpose behind this year's theme is to provide a medium where small, medium, large businesses and government can connect and establish growing relationships. To that end, the conference committee has put together an incredible slate of plenary sessions and workshops that will provide a broad spectrum of valuable information and lessons learned designed to inform and educate all. I'd like to take a few brief minutes to thank uh, some of the individuals who played some of the key roles in putting this together. Of course, the fabulous Jackie Patillo, my government event chair, whose guidance and direction has been invaluable. I would also like to thank our conference vice chairs, Brenda Maynard and Kay Ely. They were essential in driving forward the definition and execution of this year's theme, the formulation and the design of the content, rich sessions, and reaching and obtaining our huge slew of volunteers. They provided the cohesion needed to drive us to success. I'd also like to thank the entire committee, planning committee who supported Jackie and I, and these people were instrumental in all the sessions and events that are transpiring today. I would like to cite some of the individual committee chairs that assisted in all the different aspects of today, and those individuals can choose to stand up or not. Uh, Carol Miller, Kimberly Perlia, Marietta Allen, Larry Gottlieb, Paul Hanley, Grant Decker, Deirdre Murray, Ira Hobbs, Jeannie Jones Ledford, Tracy Kopi, Elaine Kapitanakis, Ted Kadani, and Act IAC Rocky Mountain Chairs Scott Pekin and Marianne Hoadley. I'd also like to thank our Act IAC Board of Advisors. They were essential and they assisted in, 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 in assisting in this amazing undertaking. Finally, I'd like to thank all the Act IAC staff but in particular two incredible individuals, Robert Smith and Ray Del Peschler. Delivering, <laughs> delivering a conference of this magnitude and watching them work in the setup and preparation was absolutely incredible. This would not have transpired without their support and of the entire government and act, industry act IAC team. Please, please join me in giving all these individuals an incredible deserved round of applause. Thank you. During the conference today, you will hear from many government and industry leaders. This morning, you will have the fortunate opportunity to hear from key government executives, program managers, acquisition leads, Office of Small Business Development leads, and staff. So let's get started. First, I would like to introduce to you Mr. John Sharaka. He is the Acting Associate Administrator of Government Contracting and Business Development at the U.S. Small Business Administration. His team supports thousands of small businesses every year as they compete for over $500 billion in federal prime contracts and billions more in subcontracts. With a background in business development, international trade, government contracting and management, he works on behalf of small businesses and entrepreneurs across
across the region as they turn to the SBA for the tools they need to start, grow, succeed, and create jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. John Chiraca. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today. I was one of the folks that was stuck in traffic this morning, so I'm happy that I was able to make it and join you. Thank you for having me. Um, I used to have uh, oftentimes speeches written for me, and my staff realized that I rarely used them, so I ended up going with notes and, and bullet points. So forgive me if I jump around a little bit, but there are certain things that I just want to touch on this morning that I think is important for you to know and to be aware of. Um, I'll give a little bit of a history and background of, of where I come from, because I think it's very relevant to the position that I have today. And then I'll speak a little bit about what the administration is looking to do with regards to small businesses, what we've done over the past several years with regards to small businesses, and where we look to go uh, moving forward. Um, I spent over 20 years uh, managing a small government contracting operation. Uh, we did a lot of work uh, with USAID. Uh, we did a lot of work with OPIC and other organizations uh, for over 20 years. It was, it was a relatively small organization. It was begun by my father, actually. And I spent that time learning how to prepare government proposals. And when I left, I was basically managing the operation. Over the last six years uh, of my career uh, at, at the uh, government contracting organization, I wore another hat as well, and I was chair of an association that represented small business government contractors. So in that context, um, I used to visit the Hill, I used to visit the SBA, and sort of promote and encourage the 23% goal for small businesses. So about... Uh, a year ago, I'd say November, actually it was before that because the process of getting someone appointed is quite long, but uh, I was appointed in November 2010 as the regional administrator for the SBA. And when I got the call halfway through the administration to join, uh, I couldn't say no, and, and I'll tell you why. Because having spent that time working in a small business and then having spent that time representing an organization that promoted small business participation in the government procurement process, uh, I had seen what had happened in the first two years of the administration. I had seen an emphasis through uh, the, the working group on procurement that was established uh, by the White House. Valerie Jarrett le uh, led an effort. They had procurement meetings quarterly uh, to make sure that the 23% goal is met, but also to keep and hold accountable all of the agencies at the deputy secretary level on a regular basis. Um, so I had seen recommendations coming out of the uh, task force, the small business task force, and I had seen the steps that had taken place. So I really couldn't say no. So I joined the administration and I joined the SBA as regional administrator uh, in November 2010. Uh, many of you might know Joe Jordan who had this position prior to me. Uh, Joe moved on to OFPP and at the time uh, I was asked to come in and, and, and step in as the acting associate administrator for government contracting and business development. Uh, and again, uh, ha having been on the other side of the table, I really couldn't say no. And I became permanent in February, early March. Uh, it's almost surreal because uh, I can remember very clearly uh, sort of uh, working on the other side of the table, trying to address many of the issues that I find myself now on the opposite side, trying to address, but also understanding sort of the dynamics of how things have to be maneuvered either through the office and through the agency itself or sometimes through the Hill uh, and through other uh, parameters. So it, I think, gives me an advantage of having been on both sides to be here today and to be able to represent um, small business government contractors. As Jackie said, there's somewhere between 400 and 500 billion dollars that are 
available for small businesses. The 23% goal gets us to about um, roughly 90 to $100 billion each year that go to small businesses. So that's a huge direct impact for small businesses. Uh, and as this administration recognizes, that is uh, the fuel to sort of make the economy run. Where else can you get $100 billion to small businesses uh, who will go out and hire and turn around the economy. So that impact is huge. That responsibility is very important. Uh, and as has, uh, you know, uh, been uh, uh, heard in the news and, and, and uh, certainly uh, we're very aware of it, our administrator has been elevated to a, uh, a cabinet level position. And to a large extent, it is because of the importance that the small business community plays uh, in the economy. So, um, what are we uh, doing and how do we make sure that we meet that 23% goal? And what are some of the initiatives that we're working on? Um, as I mentioned, the White House is very engaged. We have uh, quarterly meetings with the um, senior or secretary, I should say secretary, deputy level from each of the agencies. We just finished our um, last one. Uh, about two weeks ago. That's really a um, forum to keep accountable all of the agencies to make sure that they're meeting their goals. When we talk about 23 percent, that is for um, federal government wide on an aggregate. Each agency has their own goal to make sure that that 23 percent is met. Obviously some agencies uh, procure things that might be difficult uh, for small businesses to participate in. Other agencies, they buy a lot of things that small businesses can participate. As an example, us at the SBA, our goal is 67 percent. The Department of Energy, 10 percent. Uh, but at, as an aggregate, we, we make sure that that 23 percent goal is met. So we meet regularly at the highest levels to make sure each of the agencies are vested. And the White House is very engaged in this process. Some of you might have also heard about the Small Business Jobs Act of 2010. The Small Business Jobs Act provided many, many provisions, especially in government contracting, to make sure that um, small businesses get their fair share of uh, government contracts. Some of the things that I'll touch on, uh, we're currently working on a mentor-protege program. Uh, that may be relevant to you uh, because we, we currently have a mentor-protege program only for our 8A program. In other words, a small firm, an 8A firm, can team up with a mentor, uh, and um, the two of them, as an entity, can pursue a set-aside program. That's an advantage for the uh, protege, the 8A. It gets to team up with a mentor. But it's an advantage for the mentor because now be they're providing services and uh, development uh, um, technical assistance to the protege, but now they can pursue set-aside government contracts. So we've been asked uh, time and again, can we extend that to other programs? Can we extend that to our service-disabled veteran-owned small business program? Can we extend that to our women-owned small business program and our hub zone program? And the answer is we're working on it. Uh, the Small Business Jobs Act gave us the ability to write a rule around that. We're in the process of writing that rule and making sure that it gets through the OMB and through the process so we can extend those benefits to other programs. Another thing that might be of interest to this uh, group is the um, set-aside uh, or small business uh, set-asides under schedules. Many of your organizations probably have schedules, uh, either on the GSA schedule, on a GWAC, et cetera. Now, there had never been the ability or the authority to set aside for small business under schedules. The Small Business Jobs Act gave us that provision. There is currently a FAR interim rule that gives authority to, authority to agencies to be able to set aside small business contracts under schedules. And we're working to write a rule, a small, uh, an SBA rule, to make sure that that happens. So we work very closely with the agencies to make sure that they're aware of that. Um, I'll touch base, and I, I know I have a, a limited amount of time here today, but I'll touch base with some of the things that we're working with the White House Procurement Group on, because I think you'll see that come across 
as you go and, and, and implement projects, as you interface with the agencies, you will see an emphasis on three things, I think, in, in the short term. Uh, we're working with all the agencies to make sure that they take advantage of set-asides under schedules. Um, that's number one. We're working with agencies to make sure that under a specific amount of, uh, or a specific contract amount, uh, which is called the Simplified Acquisition Threshold, or $150,000, we're working to make sure that within that Simplified Acquisition Threshold, all the uh, business and contracts go to small businesses. That's uh, required by law, but we know that if we look at it federal, uh, government-wide, we're only hitting 50%. So we want to make sure that we move the needle. We know that if we move the needle anywhere close to 100%, we would have made our goal last year, which is 23%. So everything under $150,000, we're working with agencies to make sure that those go set aside for small businesses. And the last one, and I think is very important, is that senior leadership at all agencies are held accountable. How are the SESs being held accountable for the small business goal? Who is making sure and how are they reporting to the secretary, the deputy secretary, et cetera, uh, to make sure that those goals are in their um, a job description and that evaluation criteria is looked at regularly. So those are sort of the three main areas that we're focusing on within the next six months to make sure that our goals uh, are met. One thing that I'd leave you with before we can open it up for questions is that um, we take to heart uh, what the White House has said and done with respect to small business procurement. Uh, the President has said, and I, I think I'm uh, paraphrasing this, but he has said that the story of America's entrepreneurs, or I'm sorry, the story of America's success is written by its entrepreneurs. And our uh, administrator tells us every day that our job is to make sure that we put the wind at the back of small businesses. What are we doing day in and day out to make sure that we make things easier for small businesses to participate in government procurement? And how do we measure that and uh, report back on that in, in, uh, impact. And lastly, I would say our deputy administrator always says, make sure we meet the small businesses where they are at today. Make sure that we have tools available to small businesses that are looking to get into the government contracting world that um, achieve what they need to achieve. I'll give you an example. We know small businesses are too busy oftentimes to uh, come to an event, to go to training classes, etc. We recently implemented GC Classroom, Government Contracting Classroom, which, ha which is a series of um, uh, courses, uh, self-paced courses on our website where small businesses can go in and learn about all the different aspects of how to do work with the government. So I would encourage you uh, as you reach out to your small business partners, I know there's many small businesses here today, but I would encourage you as you reach out to the, your small business partners to have them look at us as a resource. Go to GC Classroom, uh, use our local resources at the district office, use our partners at the small business development centers and the women business centers and SCORE chapters, and encourage them to look at the opportunities that are out there. We know that the pipeline for doing business with the government can be long, can be daunting, but I'd encourage you to continue looking at resources made available, and please give us your feedback, because your feedback is important to us to make sure that we're doing our job correctly. So having said that, I'm happy to open uh, up for some questions. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> we have mics in, in the room, and so if there's anybody who have, have questions, if not, I can start it off. I think we've got Gloria here. Good morning. My question is, um, how can small businesses uh, accelerate and, and achieve given the current budget cuts and, and change environment? That's a, that's a good question. So uh, one of the things that we have focused on, and I think it's important, and our administrator uh, is very focused on this. There's a question of budget cuts, right? Everybody knows that um, we have to tighten our belts to make sure that we continue and remain uh, to continue to uh, uh, um, perform effectively. Um, but one thing that we are focused on is that 
the impact on small businesses is not disproportional, right? Oftentimes when there's the question of insourcing, there's the question of reducing budgets, we have to make sure that the pie may shrink, the 23% is 23%. We, we are not willing to um, accommodate any reduction in that 23%. What I would say is that, and, it, and, and so that's with regards to making sure that small business remains relevant. But what I'd add is that, as I mentioned previously, the Small Business Jobs Act gave us a lot of tools. One was the mentor-protege um, sort of relationship. How can you team up with mentors? How can you team up uh, to make sure that you have uh, a, a responsive uh, proposal, but yet be able to go after set aside. So there's various tools that came out of the Small Business Jobs Act that I think are helpful, but I think it's very critical to rem remind agencies and our administrator does it every day that the pie may be shrinking, the 23% is not. That's there to stay. Good morning. My name is Gloria Parker with Parker Group Consulting. Good morning. Good morning. And I um, um, I have clients who are small businesses, but also work with clients who are large businesses. And one of the main problems I'm hearing about, which, uh, first of all, let me just say, the issue of ensuring that small businesses get a fair share of the opportunity has been addressed. And the 23% and vehicles and certifications and all those things are in place. One of the things that seems not to be addressed, and my clients tend to have uh, focused on this quite a bit with me, is payment. And I know the Prompt Payment Act was passed, right. and the Prompt Payment Act says that payment should be made in a certain time frame, and if it's right. not, there's interest payments and all that. But that doesn't happen. Right. And small businesses uh, obviously have a very difficult time staying in business and paying their people when they go 60 and 90 days Absolutely. without payment. Large businesses have to deal with the same thing, but they tend to be able to, to uh, get through that. Right. So is there any conversation in these meetings that you have uh, as to how to either enforce the Prompt Payment Act or something else that can help small businesses and other businesses be paid promptly? Absolutely. That's a great question. And I, I, you know, having been, like I said, on the other side of the table, I know how critical uh, payment is to a small business to be able to pay your payroll. Uh, I know how uh, difficult it is oftentimes to get uh, contracting uh, or, or contract-based loans from banks uh, as a small business. So first of all, there is quick pay, right, which is a provision that uh, the administration implemented to make sure that prime contractors receive payment on an accelerated basis. And prime contractors uh, receive payment, I think, is within 15 days, and we're working with all the agencies to implement that. But what you point to is very critical, and how is a subcontractor to small businesses uh, uh, benefit from quick pay, or how can they not be uh, hurt by uh, waiting 90 days uh, or in excess? Uh, for payment. We're currently working through a, um, a rule through the SPA, which is the subcontracting rule, which was a provision from the uh, Small Business Jobs Act, which has many various um, uh, issues that it addresses. It, it, it addresses the issues of bait and switch when a prime contractor promotes uh, a set of subcontractors, wins the contract, and then switches it for lower cost subcontractors. It addresses that issue. But there is a provision in there as well to make sure that uh, subcontractors are paid on a timely basis. So one thing that I would add is we encourage small businesses, we encourage groups like yours, we encourage small business associations. When these rules come out for comment, please, when they're published, make comments. Because the large firms, the large associations, they will. Uh, and they will make comments based on their constituency. So I encourage you, that's very critical for, and I know, I, I've been on the other side again. I know small businesses are too busy to uh, monitor the Federal Register. Uh, they're too busy and sometimes don't think that their comments will even be uh, considered. But believe me, we consider uh, all the comments. Um, I'll point out, we, ha we have someone here in the front, Ann Riley, who is our Presidential Management Fellow at, at the SBA, 
Um, she sits down with our legal team um, and will go through the comments. We have meeting after meeting considering the comments and how we can incorporate them. So I encourage all the groups, all the association, even individual small businesses to comment on them. But the subcontracting rule, which we're working on, addresses some of the issues that you raised. Good morning. Uh, my name is Hitesh Dev. Um, I, have a, I have a quick question. So, ATA was introduced to encourage small businesses, newer businesses. Um, do you plan to have, like, add tiers to the same program? Like tiers of zero to three level, uh, zero to three or zero to four years of ATA versus four to eight? Because right now what's happening is there are so many ATAs and like companies who have ATA are, I mean, they have been in the business for like much, many more years compared to ATAs, like newer ATAs. I think adding tiers to ATA would definitely encourage like newer businesses, small businesses, and improve um, the, the utilization of the program. Sure. Well, the 8A program is a, is a statutory program that our agency implements. Um, so, you know, we implement uh, based on what is in the statute. But what I would add and what I would clarify is that the 8A program is really a development program. It's not really a contracting program, or it's not structured to be a contracting program. It's a nine-year program for the firm to develop and be able, after the nine years, to stand on its own two feet and pursue government contracts, right? So within the first several years, there is a tendency to um, be allowed a lot of uh, set-aside uh, contracts, sole source contracts, but as we move your firm through the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth years, the reliance on sole source has to be reduced. In fact, our district offices work with you to make sure that they are reduced. Uh, and so that ha we have a constant uh, portfolio, changing portfolio of 8A firms. Uh, certainly, uh, we're working to make sure that as the firms come into the program, they can hit the program, um, you know, uh, hit the ground running not to come into the program and waste the first four or five years learning how to network with government agencies, learning how the, uh, the ropes on how to pursue government contracts. We encourage firms to be able to um, have already implemented some uh, government contracts. Uh, we have what we are developing uh, for our GC classroom, sort of a pre-8A program, which will give you uh, in addition to the basics of how to do, do government contracting work, it'll give you more basics on management of government contracts, more basics of uh, implementing government contracts, and then how do you sort of uh, uh, wean yourself away from sole source contracts and be able to stand on, uh, on, on, on your two feet. The other thing that I would add is we also encourage and have developed rules to, um, to allow more mentor-protege type relationships between firms who have graduated and firms who are entering the program. So that relationship also helps the uh, new firms coming into the program. I think we have time for one more question. Hello, I'm Yvette Grenier-Smith with the Deep Water Point representing the small businesses. Good morning. Um, the budget crisis is looming and um, a couple of phenomenons is the consolidation at a lot of uh, agencies for IT services, as well as the possibility of sequestration, which will have an impact on the budget cuts. Is there anything SBA can do to help limit that impact on the small business community? Yes, thank you. Um, so there's, there's a couple of things. One is, um, first of all, again, the Small Business Jobs Act, and I've said that many times, I've named that act many times this morning, and we're very pleased with, with many of the provisions that were in there, but it gave us uh, new tools to address bundling and consolidation. So there has to be justification, written justification, much more stringent requirements for agencies to be able to do that. The other thing that um, I'll point out uh, and this was discussed at our uh, White House procurement meeting, is that when we talk about insourcing and inherently governmental, um, OFPP has made it clear that the impact to small businesses need to be considered 
and wherever possible, the impact to small businesses either has to be minimal or not at all. So the, that sort of um, emphasis on, I think everybody's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, that, oops, that, that impact on small business and that, uh, that um, focus on making sure that when we talk about inherently governmental and insourcing, how that affects small business is very visible to everybody, and we're in constant discussions with OFPP and OMB on how to mitigate those uh, impacts. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I wanted to thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'd like, I'd like to say, John, speaking for the group, <clears throat> I think we can all say that we now have a better understanding of some of the targets at SBA and your new role um, over there. And uh, again, please, let's all, you know, thank John for being here and, and give him a quick round of, another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Communication to the taxpayers and also to government and industry alike is essential. And I would like to now introduce Mr. Francis Rose of Federal News Radio, who will now present the speakers in our next panel, Connecting to Government. Mr. Rose is the host of In Depth with Francis Rose on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. He has covered all three branches of the federal government as a broadcast journalist since 1998. He joined Federal News Radio in 2006 as the producer and news anchor of the station's morning drive program the Federal Drive. He launched In-Depth in 2008 as a daily two-hour show focused on connecting federal executives to the information they need to do their jobs more efficiently and successfully. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Francis Rose. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I want to thank you all for uh, inviting me today. My thanks to uh, ACT IAC for having me here. Uh, small business has been described as the, uh, in the uh, cradle of innovation in the United States and the uh, driver that will get us out of the economic situation that we're in. So I'm very pleased to be here to uh, talk about small business solutions and how the federal government can, uh, can make that happen. Uh, this lineup is terrific, and I'm grateful to the folks at uh, ACT IAC for uh, putting it together and inviting me to be a part of it. Roger Baker is the Assistant Secretary for Information Technology at the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Chief Information Officer. Crystal Brumfeld is Tax and Procurement Counsel for the uh, uh, Senate Small Business Committee. It's good to see you this morning. And uh, Leslie Field is the Deputy Administrator in the Office of Federal Procurement Policy. Leslie, it's good to see you as well. So a uh, round of applause for uh, the panelists that I'll be talking to. Great to see you as always. Francis, good to see you. Good to see you. I guess we get to be the center here. Well, thank you all for, uh, for being here this morning. I want to start with uh, kind of a broad-based question because of what I mentioned about small businesses and their role in the economic recovery. Um, what what is the biggest impediment that you're seeing to small businesses doing business with the federal government? Leslie, I'll start with you. It's a great question. Um, one of our top priorities at OFPP generally is to improve communication. And I think the, the government's um, requirement to, to get all the information out there, making it easy to find, is something that I, that I think we need to take a little more seriously, make sure that we get the information out there, make it um, accessible to everybody out there. I think that probably is one of the, the, the top sort of challenges that we have, making sure that small businesses know where to go for help, where they go for information, where they go for opportunity, 
where they go to comment on rules, those kinds of things. So, so I think increasing that communication and making that better is something we need to do. Roger, at the VA, you obviously are committed to small business, in particular um, veteran-owned small businesses. Um, what, what are they running up against in trying to do more business with VA? So actually, uh, I think that the numbers at this point indicate that, uh, that they're doing pretty well uh, with the VA. I, I just um, I, I love having actual data uh, to share on these things. It's one thing to, uh, to say that we're trying to do a great job for veteran-owned businesses. Uh, it's another thing to have the metrics that say that uh, uh, service-disabled veteran-owned businesses, our goal for the year is 10 percent. Our performance is 40 percent. Uh, of our contracts going to service disabled uh, better known small businesses so we're um, now I will admit when you look at our metrics it's obvious that we're the Department of Veterans Affairs and not the Department of Hub Zone Affairs mm -hmm. for example we lean towards doing business with, with veterans um, and really if you look at what the TAC the uh, Technology Acquisition Center in, in New Jersey has done uh, those metrics are, uh, are pretty awesome Crystal, it's good to see you. What, what are you running up, what are you finding that your constituents and the people that approach the committee are running up against when they're trying to do business with the government, and what are they asking you and, and your colleagues on the committee for help with? I have to agree with Leslie this morning. A lot of the barriers uh, tend to stem around getting information to small businesses, having uh, sort of a hub of information where there's a one-stop shop uh, to where they can get the information, uh, knowing what resources are available. Uh, for instance, what are PTACs and where can we find them? So those are the things I think that we uh, as Congress and the executive branch can work together to, to get that information out to small businesses. Uh, we all agree that small businesses are people, the people that run them are very busy, a lot to do. But are there resources available in your view that um, maybe aren't being utilized as much as they could be, Leslie? Um, I think there are a couple of things, and, and, and thank you for the question, because it, it actually leads to something that OFPP issued this morning. Um, if you're familiar with our Mythbusters campaign from last year, this morning we issued uh, Mythbusters 2, and that really is from industry's perspective. What are the, the myths and myth, misconceptions from industry's perspective on doing business with the government? Um, and in that document, there are lots of tools and resources, and I know all the folks up here and the agencies have lots of places to go for information. But we try to lay out, uh, I believe, eight myths that um, kind of get at how do, you, how do you find information, how do, you, how do you get your foot in the door, where do you go for um, additional help and resources. So that's one tool. Um, there are many, many tools. The, the other thing I would um, also remind folks that on FedBizOps, Last year, we added functionality in, in two ways. We added a small business button so small businesses could find information faster. And we also added a vendor collaboration tool up there so that whenever there's a pre-RFP conference, whenever there's a webinar or something that, that folks might want to engage in, um, they can find it a lot more easily by just using that functionality. Excellent. Roger. So I uh, want to focus on something that we're standing up inside of uh, my organization to help exactly on that point. We've worked with the President's Management Advisory Board. It's a group of CEOs that come in uh, on a regular basis to help with how we manage uh, inside of government. And one of the things that has come out of that is the concept of uh, establishing a vendor management organization inside of, of my business. And so uh, Luanda Jones, who's here today, heads that organization. Her goal is to um, make it easier and kind of make it clearer how you navigate the, the VA system, because uh, as busy as the, uh, the heads of small businesses are, we certainly are equally busy inside of government. Uh, tough, I, I can empathize with people that are trying to get appointments with us, but at the same time, I'm trying to keep our folks busy. Um, so Lawanda's got this task, she's got a group of folks that are, that are oriented around managing, uh, if you will, the community that provides us the services, the goods and services in the two and a half billion dollars a year that we spend with the private sector. So that then focuses on how do we keep that 40 percent veteran owned small business uh, you know, moving forward, keep, keep that percent there while still getting all, everything that we need done in the community. Um, that's, uh, that's really her job in conjunction with uh, Wendy McCutcheon at the TAC. 
Kristen, do you have a sense of what's out there for small businesses that maybe they're not using as much as they could to connect with the federal agencies? Sure. I, I think I need to uh, reiterate what John said earlier in the morning address uh, with the, the option or the, the opportunity, I should say, to comment on, uh, on rulemaking. Uh, that's the opportunity for small businesses to give their input as to how programs should, should operate. What Congress does is we put a set of laws in place. Uh, we give the instruction to government agencies to do a certain thing. They are in charge of implementing those processes, and as a result of that, they receive comment from uh, uh, small businesses as to how they should implement those r rules. Uh, and so that is, I think, the prime opportunity where small businesses can, can give uh, critical input as to how a, a program should operate. I want to talk a little bit about a term that I hate, but we have to discuss it anyway, and that's the term more with less. I think probably everybody in this room is sick of hearing that term already. Um, Crystal, you are well aware of the budget situation that we're in and sure. where we're going to be headed if something doesn't happen amongst uh, the folks that you work with on the Hill. Um, what's the role of small business in, if, if we agree that more with less is a realistic path for the government to try to go on. I'm not sure we all do, but let's just say for the sake of argument we do. Um, if we agree that that's where we're headed, what's the role for small business to do that, and what can you and your colleagues on the Hill do to try to facilitate that while we're dealing with some of the budget issues that we're dealing with? I think one of the first things a small business should do uh, when they're preparing to uh, do work with the federal government is to first know what the agency wants and need, not just what you all offer, um, because what you offer may not be what they need. Um, many agencies have forecasts uh, they, that they put out to uh, inform small businesses of what is to come and what opportunities are available. Uh, please take full advantage of uh, getting your hand on the forecast and, and knowing what's a, a coming up, uh, what opportunities are coming up for you. Um, a second thing is to, to just get to know your Azebus. The Azebus are in the agencies uh, to advocate for small businesses. They know what's coming up as well, and so get to know the Azebus uh, and, and form a relationship with them. I think those two are two critical things that small, business can, small businesses can do. Am I off base in my criticism of the more with less idea, Roger? No, actually, uh, I CIOs in the private sector have been in the do more with less mode for years. Um, and typically what you do from an infrastructure standpoint is you try to squeeze the dollars out of what is there already so that you have dollars to spend on building new things. Um, you know, in the private sector as a CIO, um, you know, when I went in and talked to the CEO and said, I can take $10 million out of our infrastructure costs without losing any services, what that meant was we were adding $10 million to the bottom line of the corporation. You can calculate that value out in EPS. In, in government, we've got to do exactly the same thing. So the, the, the less with more really has to be around the infrastructure side in the IT world, uh, squeezing dollars out of that, but more with more needs to be on the development side of things. What kind of new functionality can we provide? Because one of the things that we've got to make certain that we get across um, to everyone involved is, the, is that in today's world, you can't transform the businesses of government without the technology to underpin that transformation. And so the amount of money that we spend on a successful transformation project from a technology standpoint is probably 1 20th of the dollars that it saves from the business optimization uh, that, that goes on. You know, at the VA right now, very critically, we're looking at transforming the benefits process for veterans. We must do that. If you look at our backlog, it's just critical that we accomplish that. We can't resolve that without the technology. And so the investment side is critical to view as an investment. You know, one of the issues that we face classically in IT is that uh, all of IT is looked at like, like a, uh, a cost. And costs you try to reduce, investments you try to increase. Um, we've got to make that change so that, so that everybody involved in the departments, you know, on the Hill, in the administration recognize that uh, we're investing in changing the business processes 
of the government, and that investment's going to pay substantial dividends uh, when we get through. So I think there's a combination of less with more and more with more in, in there, but you've got to segment it out. And when you say it that way, it occurs to me that maybe the right term is just different with different rather than more with less or whatever, because there are going to be some areas where you're going to be investing more. Yeah. There are going to be some places where you're cutting substantially. And, and what I'm getting at is, if I'm a small business owner and trying to understand this, the slogans that I hear a lot in the media, including me sometimes, I, I need to cut through all of that and understand what the dynamic really is yeah. going to be for the foreseeable future. So maybe the slogan is, the money's going to move. Yeah. Um, and, and what you've got to be able to track is, in the department that you're working with, where is the money moving from and where is it moving to? Because you really don't want to be trying to compete with everybody in the place where it's moving from. Uh, and you want to figure out where is it moving to. You know, for us, for example, I'll just pick one. I mean, we have moved uh, money from other places in infrastructure into our wireless infrastructure. Because if you look at some of the things that are in the press, that we're talking about that VA is going to do, real-time location systems or uh, iPads, all of those things are dependent on a Wi-Fi infrastructure in, in all the facilities. So, you know, moving money from um, old traditional ways of doing business, from phone systems, from uh, data centers, and into, uh, you know, the, the more interesting, the things that are really going to help transform the business. In this transformational environment, different with different, or whatever we want to call it, um, what's in Mythbusters 2? There were some things that I saw in there this morning that I think fit that in helping businesses, especially small businesses, understand what's about to happen. Right. I think there are a couple things in Mythbusters 2, and I just want to build on one point uh, that Roger was making, that when we, when we talk to agencies, we're talking now about buying smarter. Um, we're, we're asking them to put more of their, their dollars under spend management to make sure they understand sort of where everything is going. And so the innovation that small businesses bring to the table can help us do that in many, many ways. So when we talk to, to the contracting officers and we talk about what needs to happen next, we need to look at smarter ways to buy things. And so I think that fits, fits uh, very nicely. Um, in Mythbusters 2, there were a couple of things. We, we wanted specifically in that uh, document to make sure that, that our time with industry was productive and that um, uh, agencies and, and uh, industry could come together around very specific requirements, uh, making sure that we could get to the right folks that needed to help us with the acquisition strategy. Are we asking for the right things? Do we understand the marketplace? So helping us understand those kinds of things um, and then helping, to, helping them to manage the contracts a little bit better along the way. So, so I think the whole spectrum from requirements through deliveries is, is uh, something that we're, we're looking to improve. In just a moment, um, we want to hear from you. We have the microphones that you saw earlier this morning. So uh, jot your questions down and be ready to come over to the microphone, identify yourself, and address your questions to our panel. We'll start taking questions from you all in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, Crystal, I wanted to ask you, as you think about what Roger and Leslie are talking about and the Buying Smarter concept, what's the role of the committee and Congress in general in helping agencies do that. Is there some role still to play? Is, are the legislation and the policy in place already to do that? Or is there something more that you think uh, that would be an appropriate role for you folks? I, still, I, I think there's still a role that we can play uh, t together to collaborate on things. Uh, we meet um, our agency, I'm sorry, our committee has jurisdiction over the Small Business Administration. And so we meet regularly with the, uh, with the officials over at that agency to determine what's the need of small businesses and how we can collaborate to, to, to get that need uh, accomplished. And so there's always a time and opportunity to collaborate with agencies. We meet, um, as I mentioned earlier, with the Azebus to see what, what needs are available and how we can work together with them as well. And so we're always, always, always available and uh, willing to work with agencies uh, government-wide to, to come up with solutions to small business problems. Does what you're hearing from the Small Business Administration and the needs of businesses sync with what you hear directly from constituents through the committee? Oftentimes, yes, yes. Uh, a lot of the small businesses uh, not only talk to the Small Business Committee and the staff there, but they also have a relationship with many of the officials at the Small Business Administration. And so there's, a, there's kind of a, a, a three-way uh, uh, 
communication system. And so we're, we hear many of the things that they hear over at the Small Business Administration. Uh, questions from the audience, if you want to head over to the microphones, and uh, we have time for a number of them. Sir, Good right morning. Uh, my name is Mark Oliver. I'm the chair of the OSTABU for the federal government and also the director for the Department of Interior Small Business Program. Uh, I just want to make a comment, if possible. Uh, one of the things that you heard about was the OSTABU offices. They are there to open the doors for you as you deal with the small business uh, community within the agencies. But I do want to give you a website that will give you all the information you need about working with the U.S. Department of Interior and other federal agencies across the board. Uh, that website is www.osdbu.gov. Now, we talk about resources. There are tons of information pertaining to the OSTBU and how to work with the federal government on that website. So I encourage you to visit that website, gather as much information as you can possibly. We also have a sample capability statement and also a transmittal letter. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. We're there to service you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Crystal, you mentioned the OSTABUS a couple of times. First of all, what's it mean? Spell it out since we're acronym friendly in the sure. government. Sure. It's Office of Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization, um, and they are your advocate uh, within the federal agencies. What's the process look like when I come to an OSTABU and say, hey, I'm, I'm small business, I do whatever I do, and I want to do business with the government? Yeah, I think Mark can probably answer it better, but from, um, from my understanding, you go in and you have your capability statement available um, so that you can uh, further explain what your business does and how you can perform and all, what you can offer the federal government. Uh, it also goes back to knowing what needs they have. Um, and so once you go in, you go in with basically your resume, letting them know what you uh, have available and what services or products you offer and how you can work with them to, to get the job done. Right, and, and then building on that, what we tried to do in Mythbusters too is to say, gosh, take what you can do and then look at what the agency does, look at what their budget was last year, look at what their, not only their forecast, but what else have they put out there, what, are they, what does their mission statement say, and, and be very specific about how a small business can, can target the need of a particular agency or a bureau within that agency or even a program within that bureau. Being very specific and very targeted, I think, is, is helpful. So I think, you know, the, the thing to recognize is that the OSDABU is your advocate inside the agency. You know, our, it, our first goal is to deliver the product or service. And, you know, we've got 150 ongoing projects. We've got a lot of infrastructure things going on. And I'll be the first one to admit that not every one of those projects, as they're putting together their design, and their acquisition plan thinks small business first. And so the OSDABU really uh, gets involved in that process and looks at what we're planning on doing and provides us with some advice, and I will tell you a little bit of a referee role of, you know, can this actually be done from a small business standpoint? Can we take what we're doing and make it available to small businesses to bid on? So they're your advocate inside the agency. They're the, they're the organization that really needs to understand what you can do, what small business can do for us, and what small business can't do for us. Other questions from the audience? Ma'am? Hello, it's Yvette again. Um, this is really for all three of you. Uh, while I applaud you on the 40% uh, on the veteran-owned businesses, what new policies are coming to encourage all of our companies to hire veterans? Oh. I wish I knew that one off the top of my head because I know there are. Um, I'm not being a good political point here because I'm supposed to know that stuff. I know there are things that are oriented around um, getting better and higher and going. I mean, from our standpoint, inside of the Department of Veterans Affairs, we're doing a lot of work to um, you know, hold conferences and awareness type events. There's a huge one coming up in Detroit for veteran-owned small businesses and for veteran hiring. Uh, in that area in the, I think it's the last week of June. Um, and you basically will be able to find every senior official in the Department of Veterans Affairs at that event. Um, smaller events throughout the country focused on hiring. Um, very gratified to see that with the focus that the country and uh, a lot of organizations have put on it, that uh, veterans unemployment has come down substantially since that focus has come in. 
Uh, I know there are things coming that are oriented around hiring veterans, and I wish I could give you specifics. Um, I'll go back and do a little research, so next time I get that question, I can answer it better. Uh, more questions uh, right here, sir. Good morning, Jeff Shen with Red Team Consulting. Uh, this is a question for Leslie Field. Um, I'll preface the question in telling you that this is a really, really hard question. Great. So I'm just apologizing. Awesome. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, you got given, the right given, person if you're going to ask hard <laughs> questions. Given, given OFPP's um, a role, expansive role across all the federal in determining uh, procurement policy, have you seen the issues or challenges differ between, say, the DOD market and, and the civilian market as it pertains to small business contracting? Uh, that's a great question. So um, we at OFPP obviously have sort of purview over the procurement regs for civilian and defense agencies, but we don't actually have purview over the defense workforce. And so our, our workforce efforts are targeted toward DOD. But what I can say is that because DOD has a big infrastructure and they have, they have lots of policies and programs, it, it's... Um, it's, it's a different environment. It's, it's much bigger. It's, it's probably we've got lots of resources, and so it's slightly different than the civilian agencies where if you look at the other 23 CFO Act agencies, you've got lots of different organizations, lots of different bureaus. And so I, I think the marketing and the outreach is probably a little bit, needs to be a little bit different. I mean, you've got to know more people in the civilian agencies because it's, it's just wide and more dispersed. So there's a little bit more effort that goes into finding out who do you need to talk to? How do you need to, to work um, with this particular agency? Every agency is a little bit different. The culture is a little bit different. Um, so, I, you know, I think working with DOD, uh, it's a little bit, little bit probably more, um, I wouldn't say streamlined, but at least you, you kind of know who everybody is over there. And the civilian agencies, it's just a little bit harder, I think, to find the right folks to talk to, find the right program managers. Um, um, and so I think that, you know, the communication, again, finding the right people is probably the, the hardest challenge. That wasn't a hard question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so before we I'm just going to mark it for a second and tell you that uh, we, we're trying to address that problem. And about twice a year we hold an event um, where we bring in the program managers for our 16 major initiatives to talk all about what they're doing in their initiative and what they're going to need. So make it very transparent who you need to be talking to about solutions. It isn't easy. I mean, we've got uh, 8,000 people inside the IT organization and probably five times that number of folks from the businesses that influence what we do. And while I may have a clue who the decision makers are in there, I'm not really very available either, uh, as folks who've tried to get in to visit me will, will tell you. So there's a reason why business developers get paid good dollars. Uh, if they can figure out who's actually making the decision, that's a very valuable thing to the company. Um, I'm, before we go back to the audience for questions, I want to use the S word, which we heard a little bit about this morning, sequestration. Um, I'm not going to ask anybody to comment on how you're planning, because I know nobody is. Um, but in the event we get to that, what should I be thinking about as a small business owner and how I might fit into whatever the agencies have to do to navigate sequestration? I don't know that it would be necessarily that much different than it would be now. I think, again, finding, finding the right people to talk to, understanding what programs may or may not be affected, um, and, and trying to figure out what niche uh, small business brings to the agency that is looking for a solution. Mm -hmm. Roger, any thoughts about sequestration? So I will make certain that I uh, emphasize for everybody here that I saw last week uh, that it had been determined that VA would not be uh, part of sequestration. Uh, thankful for, uh, for that. Uh, clearly it demonstrates uh, the focus on veterans uh, and the service that was provided uh, from the administration. Um, you know, from there, uh, I, I think it fits with the standard model that we've talked about, which is the dollars are going to move. There are places that are going to still be spending and there are places that are not going to be spending. Uh, and that's what the real focus is on, getting in and figuring out where, the, where those are going to go. And that's a technique that, uh, that we all learn. Uh, some do it better than others uh, as far as targeting where the dollars are going to get spent. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to handicap what is happening on the Hill in sequestration, but do you have any thoughts about how ha the entire budget discussion as it plays out over the next six months or so might affect the way companies try to work with the government? I, I definitely think that there uh, would be some, some impact. We're just hoping that it does not affect the small businesses uh, as much as many people are predicting that it will. 
uh, we're, we're working with agencies to, to ensure that small business still remains the focus of, of, of this, the agencies. Um, and we're also uh, encouraging all of the agencies to push towards that 23% goal. We, we really want to see it met this year. More questions for the panel? Hi, I'm Daryl Scott. My company is Circo Incorporated. Uh, Roger was probably being a little bashful, but uh, Veterans Administration uh, launched recently uh, a website that helps VA veterans uh, reintegrate uh, and join the workforce. It's a website that's actually developed by Circo, uh, VA, F-O-R, Vets, dot VA, dot gov. Uh, it, it's a very uh, well-produced website. It's a cross between uh, services uh, for for people who, who need help uh, getting their resume back together or just uh, on a social basis, but also to help them find jobs either in the VA or other federal government agencies. Uh, the, the other issue I wanted to ask, maybe Mark knows the, the answer, but uh, I believe sometime last year it was the um, uh, GAO issued a report uh, listing all of the agencies that were not compliant uh, with the new law that actually made it uh, a requirement for OSDABU to actually report to either the administrator or deputy administrator. And in many agencies, the OSDABU reports to somebody in procurement, but they actually are supposed to have a, a, a seat at the table. And I wanted to know if that report is going to be updated or is that something that uh, a link can be provided at um, the website that Mark mentioned. That's uh, osdaboo.gov. Thanks. So the report uh, came out, uh, I believe, uh, maybe this time last year. It had been uh, 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 done uh, a few years prior to that. Um, I don't anticipate it being updated um, anytime soon. Uh, it was actually a directive. Uh, from Congress that GAO conduct the study, um, but we can uh, make it available on the Azdebu website um, so that uh, small, business, small businesses can see which agencies were not in compliance uh, with the, uh, it's, it's actually section K3 of the Small Business Act, which requires that uh, Azdebu's report solely and directly to the head of each agency. Um, the purpose for that provision was that they could have the ear of the agency head um, on small business matters, uh, which Congress thinks is very critical. Um, and so we can provide that link to the Azebu Council so that they can provide that information on their website. And, and I'm going to thank Daryl for, uh, uh, for helping me here. Um, certainly as, as a company, and both from the question, there are several websites uh, for veterans employment that the VA has uh, brought up. There's VA for Vets, as he noted. Um, there's Vet Success. And there is also the National Resource Directory, all of which are aimed at helping match veterans up with employment and also uh, work to turn uh, MOS, uh, you know, the, what, what they have done in the service, into things that are understandable uh, on resumes for private sector jobs. Uh, these, you know, the service members have tremendous skills, but they're skills that aren't necessarily readily uh, and easily understood by the private sector folks. Uh, and so helping translate that into what it means to a private sector job has been a substantial focus uh, on our part as well. So thanks, Daryl. I appreciate it. I wanted to follow up, Roger, on something we talked about a little bit earlier, and you were nodding your head in agreement when we talked about the idea of understanding what it is that the agencies need instead of what it is that companies do. Uh, I hear that a lot from agency people, and I wonder what advice you would have for some of the folks in this room to better understand what it is that you need. Where do they go? Hopefully they'll come to places like Federal News Radio and learn what the agencies are doing. But what, where do they dig that information in when maybe they're not the size to be able to go out and find it, bring in their own BD person where they're the BD person? Right. Um, you know, I, I would start with, I, I know it's not easy. Um, you know, I've run a small company before. Uh, finding the opportunities is, is fairly difficult. Um, you know, we try to be as, uh, as open as possible you know, on, on uh, the opportunities that, that we're going to come out with, but even that is, is difficult. Um, I can tell you, you know, uh, I can tell you where, where not to start, if you don't mind a little 
to me, humorous anecdote. Uh, I get about 50 emails a day uh, from folks that believe the right place to start in selling to the VA is with me. Um, I can assure you that it's not. Um, as I mentioned to, uh, to James Japel, who's, who's shadowing me for two weeks, you know, I get about 50 emails a day that each one of them has exactly the right solution for the VA, if only our problem were the one they have a solution for. Um, that's, that's the difficult part. You know, our, our problems tend to be uh, nuanced from, you know, from the issues we deal with. Um, they're not the same as the private sector for a variety of reasons. Uh, we have, I'll just admit, we have predetermined how we want to solve problems pretty early uh, on things. And it's probably not going to be a 2012 solution. It's probably going to be a 2004 solution. That's just the way the government operates. So as you're, as you're in looking at how, how to sell to us, the one thing I would tell you is, from my view, if it's been built, that's probably a good solution. If it's been built elsewhere, that's probably a good solution from our standpoint, lower risk uh, on, on approaches. If you can point to uh, where you've done the same work very successfully before, that helps a lot. Um, as we all know, you know, there are there are thousands of alumni of the VA out there, each of which has uh, some piece of information relative to where we're going, although we're moving fairly quickly. Um, you know, going to the events that, that we do to try to, you know, to do education on that is clearly invaluable. I can't communicate to the community as well as the program manager can where they expect to go on a, on a major initiative. And then recognize that there are a lot of dollars going down through some of these major initiatives. You know, every one of them is 30 to 100 million dollars in a variety of IT projects. So they're worth targeting, uh, but also recognize that if they're worth targeting, there are probably a thousand companies that are targeting that. It it, it is competitive. Um, in the end, it's uh, it's to me the same as as it has always been. What do you know? Who do you know? How can you propose your solution uh, and get that? You know, for us, you know, T4 is huge right now. Uh, teaming with a T4 partner is, uh, is probably a fairly critical way of getting into the VA from a, from a technology standpoint. Um, you know, other than that, I'm not sure what other kind of hints uh, well, that's, I, that's I can lay lot. out there. Leslie? So absolutely, building on that. So. Um, I, I think being very specific in, in your proposals, so making sure you understand what the agency needs, but being very specific about where you've done the work, um, yeah. what it looked like, and what you're specifically proposing for that unique situation. Sometimes proposals, um, because there's so much work out there and, and you know, everybody's busy, tend, can be very general. I think contracting officers and program managers are looking for very specific bits of information that they can look at. Also, if, if you don't happen to get an award, ask for a debriefing from the contracting yep. officer so you're very clear on, on what happened and, and why you didn't get it. And one of the best practices we learned is even if you do get it, ask for a debriefing. If you do get the award, ask for a debriefing so that you can really understand what it is that you did well so that you can replicate it on another contract. Um, and then another best practice that we heard is once you're, once you're finished with a particular performance period, ask your contracting officer, make sure that there's a past performance report put into the system, into PEEPERS, so that when another contracting officer is thinking about going uh, to your company, that there's, that there's a, a record of performance there. Yeah. And, and know what you do well. Uh, and so, so this is stepping outside my role as, uh, in, in government and going back to being a CEO of a small company. Know what you do well. The government's pretty good at figuring out that you really don't have all that experience that you're, uh, that, that you're representing you've got, that you may actually be able to hire somebody that has that experience, but that person's not on board yet. You know, there's a lot of games that get played in here. And if you shotgun the government, you're going to spend a lot of time in BNP and not necessarily win a lot of things. I, I will tell you that we have some small businesses that are very focused on what they do at VA. And I would tell you they do a great job, and their probability of continuing to win business with the VA is very, very high. But they're focused on doing what they do, and they're focused on doing that very, very well. And I would tell you that shotgunning um, is expensive and isn't really going to increase your probability of, of winning things. Know what you do well. 
know what you've got great past performance in, and, and go down that path with us uh, rather than trying to be everything to us. Keep your CEO hat on then for just a moment. It sounds like what you're talking about is just the best practices of customer service after you've completed the deal. You know, Leslie's talking about even if you win a contract, get a debriefing about why you did it, do the follow-up work after the work is complete and all of that kind of stuff. You know, um, starting and running a small business is, uh, is very difficult. Succeeding as a small business is, uh, is very difficult. And you've got to go back, you know, to your, uh, to your Harvard MBA and your McKinsey and, and all of those pieces and understand what is it that drives success. And, and I would tell you that the thing that I appreciate in what's driving success is doing a great job for the customer. Um, there's, to me, there's nothing that succeeds better than um, your customer was very happy with the job that you did. I mean, inside the VA these days, um, we do small projects and we stop projects when they're failing. I think we notice the companies that uh, help us succeed in projects, you know, deliver things that make us successful where we might not have been successful before, and the companies that, you know, they're kind of there with people, but if we fail, that's our problem, not theirs. I think we notice that difference. And I think that uh, as you go into continuous recompetes that are, uh, that are occurring with our projects, you're going to find that the folks that help us succeed tend to win and the folks that are just there to gather business tend to not get more business. You know, if only because I'm going to stop the ones that are not succeeding and spend money on the ones that are. How has PMAS and that effort changed your relationship with small businesses, if at all? I'm, I'm, not, sure, uh, I'm not sure I can relate it to, uh, to the nuance of how it's changed it with small business versus all businesses. Um, you know, when we miss a date and we have um, our first strike meeting, we, we've renamed them tech stats, um, but any project that misses a date immediately gets an invitation to meet with the assistant secretary in a tech stat meeting. Uh, the vendor's there. And we have the discussion about why did this project miss its date. And if the answer is we weren't able to get the staff, you know, we didn't get the right technical staff or a variety of things. What the vendor hears is, where's the risk on this? The risk is this project is going to stop right here if it's not going to be successful going out. And I think they get the message that everybody's in the boat on this one. Uh, the program, the customer, the program staff, and the contractor. If I stop the project, everybody is affected by that. And so. The whole goal of a first strike meeting is to make certain that we never have a second strike meeting, uh, to get everybody uh, aligned. The analogy that I've used is, you know, if we start a project and everybody's in the boat, but they're all rowing different directions, the first strike meeting is all about shooting a couple holes in the bottom of the boat so everybody understands if you don't row in the same direction, the thing is going to sink. Um, so we, uh, we try to make sure that's a very, very clear. Crystals, we've talked about the, uh, these issues that the vendors are having trying to do business with the agencies. What, beyond commenting on rules and so on, what effect can they have on the business that you do on the Hill to advocate for themselves or to advocate in groups and so on to, to try to get through to you the issues that they're having and things they need help with? Sure. If, if you're ever in uh, Washington, D.C., then please uh, call ahead to schedule a meeting with a member of the committee uh, or uh, just uh, just drop by. Um, sometimes we have time available where we can sit down with you and hear what issues you're facing, uh, what barriers you're, you're having with a particular agency, and, and sometimes we can we can we can help smooth those those things. Um, also, consider sending in letters, uh, uh, recommending certain things, or commenting on certain things that Congress is doing or things that are happening or that you see trends that you see are happening uh, out in the workforce. And also you can write a joint letter of recommendation for a particular piece of legislation uh, that you feel would help small businesses recommending that we co-sponsor it or that's, that Congress passes the legislation. 
uh, can, keeping the lines of communication open, I think, is a, probably the most important thing that a small business can do, just letting us know what's going on out there so that we can better help, help the small businesses. A couple more minutes for questions before we wrap up. Communication is a theme that we've talked about in various forms in all of this. And it's the core of the Mythbusters campaign, the original one that Dan started, and this new one that's out uh, today. What are the agencies, do you think, doing well along in, in the Mythbusters theme, and what are some of the things that you'd like to see them hit a little harder, when, especially in the small business context? Right. Um, what we're hearing is that agencies are, are a little bit more mindful of that pre-RFP space, that they are taking more opportunities to have webinars or to have industry days, that they're trying to get out the, the value proposition to have folks come in for an industry day, if, if that's the case. Um, there, was a, there was a good story coming out of one of the smaller agencies, and uh, they'd had a procurement for a long time, and it had always been sort of the same thing, and they wanted to do something different. So they thought about all the high-tech ways that they could involve more small businesses and, and more new vendors, and it turned out just a simple conference call. A simple conference call at the right time with the right outreach I got about 100 folks, new folks on the call. Um, they had a tremendous amount of competition, and a new vendor was awarded the contract with a new and innovative way. So I, I, I see things happening in that space that I'm, that I'm, I'm pleased with. So I'm, we're hoping to do that. On the other side, the challenges, I think, um, I think the specificity, making sure that, that folks are targeting their, their efforts to a particular solution, a particular, even just a, a suite of agencies, so that they can make good use of valuable resources and as Roger said, you know, do, do what you do well and do it in a particular um, targeted area. We, we are trying very hard to, to not just go back to the same old solution providers. That's a large part of what uh, the program management accountability system is designed to affect. And so where you see us, just if you will, pushing the, uh, the enter key, going to the default vendor, um, that's a really, really good time to point that out uh, to us as a, as a department. Um, I would encourage you to, uh, to let Luanda know that if you see it. We'll go look at that acquisition. I don't want the same old solutions to the problems. If we get the same old solution, that means we're still going to have the same old problems. And so we're trying to look at how do we do things differently. That means we've got to involve a lot more vendors. We've got to get some better ideas in what we're doing. I know we don't do that easily. I know that you know our folks have been with us for a long time, and they tend to do business the same way. Uh, but we're looking for different solutions from a management perspective, and we're going to try to be of help to you as you look at doing things differently and helping us do things differently to make certain that that gets into the program. And I think that's something that, that we can bring to this, is trying to drive just do things differently uh, down to the programs. Leslie, Roger, Crystal, thank you very much for a terrific conversation. Thank you for your attention, and thanks to ACT IAC for having us. Thank you. you can leave. about the rest of you, but I'm energized. We had a great uh, keynote speaker and a fantastic panel. Did you all know that that was my boss? Yeah. <laughs> Where's Robert? I'm off script. <laughs> okay, now we're going to take a short 10-minute break for coffee. After that, we will begin this morning's next plenary session, which will focus on topics in the small business marketplace through the sharing of personal experiences and lessons learned. Hopefully you'll achieve a better perspective on areas in which it will help you to improve your organizations. I'll see you back here in 10 minutes sharp. Yeah.